Hallo Claire. Hallo. Kannst du mich gut hören? Ja. Gut. Bist du jetzt über den Link ähm, auf der Konferenzwebseite reingekommen? Nee, über den, den du uns per Mail geschickt hattest. Ja. Ist das ein Unterschied? Nein, eben, weil ich wollte eigentlich gerne testen, ob der auch funktioniert, so wie er sollte. Kann ich ja machen. Das wäre super. Ja, gehe ich mal kurz raus. Hallo, Können wir anfangen? Sind alle da? Hallo, ist noch nicht da, aber fangen wir an. Also ist die gleich wieder zurück oder sollen wir anfangen? Bin auf dem Weg. Ah. Super. Hallo, man kannst du noch stumm schalten? Ah. Okay. Welcome to our colloquium, the form of images and their discursive effects. My name is Claire Hemmo and I'm a researcher at the Academy of Art and Design in Basel. Together with my colleagues, from the Institute's Digital Communication Environments, we will present five projects. Our contributions all explore the form of images regarding their effect on the discursive situations they open and reshape. The first contribution by Paloma Lopez and Arno Schubach explores how images trigger the reflection of design students whether to engage in the discourse of image theory or to activate a process of image making. 
The second essay by Sandra Bischler and Viola Deal focuses on a historically documented design exercise how to observe the change of image meaning by creating various pairs of images. The third contribution by Susan Kaeser and myself deals with enabling participation through images, be it in relearning language after brain injury or in including different perspectives in participatory urban planning processes. Our fourth essay by Michael Renner and Kambis Schaffe asks how we negotiate the supposed reality in drawings and in photographs. Our final contribution by Natasha Tümpel explores how the designer negotiates not only the image in the making, but also the icons, control panels and functions of the computer software. The contributions in our colloquium all stem from research projects and teaching formats at the Institute Digital Communication Environments of the Academy of Art and Design in Basel. We will now present all five contributions, one after the other, and have time for co collective discussion afterwards. So we will now share the video a moment, please. Um. The master program, Visual Communication and Iconic Research at the Academy of Arts and Design Basel, focuses on the reflection on images and their meaning. However, we do not equate this reflection with the theoretical reflection about images, but also understand the making of images as a way to reflect on them. Thus, we conceive theoretical and practical forms of reflection as complementary approaches, which is also manifest in the respective use of pictures in our teaching, as Arno Schubach and myself would like to show today. I myself teach picture theory and develop the basic questions and structure of my lecture with the use of two photographic pictures from the 1920s and 30s which have already been presented in the introduction of Peter Geimer's wonderful book, Inadvertent Images. In the classroom, I present the two pictures without title or further information and ask the students for describing the pictures. Initially, the students often hesitate to articulate what they see because they fear, not without good reason, an ambiguous question. But even a mumbled, I see a city, can serve as a starting point for the discussion, which then mostly begins to revolve around the two black holes in the pictures. But soon the question arises, where are these two holes? In the case of the photograph on the left, the solution is usually found quite quickly. It is a broken window that we see in the picture, and which is also the title of Pratt Weston's work from, the from 1937. The photograph on the right is more puzzling. Often the idea comes up that we see a city through a window that is broken. But then, instead of a black hole, wouldn't we see the city through the hole in the window? Also, other more complex ideas are usually met with objections again. Finally, I provide the title of André Cartes' 1929 work, Broken Plate. With this clue, some student will correctly guess that it is a photograph with a damaged class support. The black hole here is not in the depicted object, but in the picture object or artifact itself. 
Thus, a comparison of these two photographs helps to introduce two basic dimensions of pictorial representation, the function of the picture to depict and the picture itself as an object or artifact. I illustrate these two dimensions with this scheme and present the structure of my lecture on this basis. Firstly, the lecture discusses different understandings of the relation of the picture to the depicted object. And secondly, it addresses the specific materialities and realities of different types of pictures, such as drawing, painting, photography, or digital imagery. How have I used these two images so far? I used them to first invite students to describe the images they see and to reflect on what those images show. In addition, I steer the discussion in the direction that the images illustrate basic questions of picture theory. However, it would be too easy to put Weston's picture on the side of its transparency and the depicted object and Kertesz's work on the side of opacity and picture artifact. That is why I ask the students to take another look, closer look at the images in order to detail the description of the pictures and to intensify our experience of them in such a way that we can touch upon the reflection on pictures embodied in them. The case of Weston's photograph, the black hole that takes up most of the image not only reveals the hole in the window, but also draws the eye to the surface of the image, bringing its opacity to the fore. Furthermore, the intricate framing of the photograph parallels it with the framing of the window without identifying that, thus scrutinizing the analogy of picture and window that permeates the Western culture since the Renaissance. In comparison to Weston's intricate composition, Kelter's work can now seem less elaborate and linked to exactly this analogy of window and picture. The hole in the class support that makes this picture so fascinating was in fact an accident that Kertesz accepted as part of his work by giving it the title Broken Plate. Yet, why is the hole in the class plate black? First and foremost, it should reveal the view through the plate and could therefore just as well be white. Everything depends on the background or backing of the class plate. So this whole refers us to the concrete situation of the picture and our gaze. Every picture is approached in a situation as my digital projection in the bright classroom. I will limit myself to these hints on my use of images in teaching picture theory. What is the discursive effect of images in the teaching situation? Obviously, it is not restricted to evidencing or illustrating a theoretical thinking um, untouched by our experience of um, images. On the contrary, I make use of a much more fundamental discursive effect of images. Pictures raise questions and challenge theoretical approaches when we experience them. This discursive effect consists in the fact that pictures thinking on images starts to lodge itself in our gaze. It is this effect that I try to use in teaching picture theory in order to encourage the students' theoretical reflections on images. Learning how to reflect on images and their meaning is also the main goal of my class, but I aim at enabling the students to develop a research question that they then explore further through the production of images. In order to achieve that, we always start with a text. A text that usually is not specifically related to image theory, and frequently not even to images at all, but with topics as varied and unrelated as neutrality, metaphor, or objectivity. A chapter of Eleanor Roche's book, Principles of Categorization, is, for example, one of the texts we would discuss together in class. I then confront them with 
the series of images, and we look at them from the perspective of this text in order to learn that also knowledge that does not specifically address image questions can be made productive for the reflection on images. A selection of examples of Otto Neurath's isotype and their changes over time will allow us to think about categorization and the power the visualization of categories develops through their visual expression. The discussion of these images should serve, however, as well as starting point to the main goal of my class to learn to formulate questions that address the way images create meaning and how to relate those questions back to a reflective design practice. Basic research questions, therefore, aiming towards understanding the how and why, not applied ones as we usually find them in the design context. Guiding students towards the formulation of more abstract questions about images and their meaning is a challenging task as it collides with the way they have learned through their previous design experience. In day-to-day -day practice, a particular communication need is provided by the teacher or the client. A specific task is formulated as a starting point. This will allow the designer to identify a problem to be solved a specific public to address a particular visual language and color palette that is considered suitable, a visual convention that can be used or subverted. The final design will be frequently generated based on a habitual way to address the topic and on the designer's individual skills. Normally, no focus will be put on questioning those traditions. Visual conventions and the attractiveness of the results usually justify those choices. In my classroom, they will be encouraged to do the opposite. I want them to formulate as a starting point a more abstract question about images and the way they create their meaning, like um, what is perceived as subjective or objective when it comes up to depictions of landscapes, or what influences our understanding of object size in photography? In order to try to answer such questions, they will produce a multiplicity of images which, by recreating the same subject multiple times with only slight changes, will allow them to observe the effect of those variations on their own perception, while connecting those observations back to their original question. The images my students develop in class do not illustrate the discussed topic. They are, through practical experimentation, an active way of thinking about the topic itself and its consequences for the realm of the visible. While designing, altering, combining and changing, the main question remains always in sight. Every step means a further approach or departure to the topic that is being reflected. The resulting visuals help students to precise their questions as they unveil parameters that were not taken into consideration in the very beginning. This will often lead to the formulation of further questions, questions that will remain unanswered, but that will help to generate an awareness of the complexity of the nature of images. In that sense, the generation of images in the classroom simultaneously opens up and specifies the space for discussion. The images they create in the context of this class will not allow to properly answer the original question, as that would require much more time, dedication and further research than what is available in the very limited time frame of that course but they will have gained knowledge about the nature and structure of basic research questions and above all, the influence that even seemingly insignificant visual decisions can have on the reading of the image and therefore about the power that lies within image creation itself. In sum, we both aim in our teaching at engaging the students in a reflection on images and their meaning. But we choose different strategies 
and therefore use images differently. Whereas Paloma draws on design practice and the creation of variations of images in order to produce and specify questions about images, I proceed from the theoretical discourse in order to confront it with images and to challenge it in the context of our experience of images. The goal is common, but the way how the image is supposed to help us think about images is different. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So hello, can you hear me? Hello, yeah, okay. So I start, thank you. Um, in the next contribution, uh, Sandra and I are going to deal with practical assignments from the teaching of visual communication at the Basel School of Design. First with practical, uh, with whole historical, but then with current examples. We focus on a specific assignment, the creation of so-called semiotic image cycles in which images are juxtaposed, combined or modified, and the changes and dimensions of meaning produced are investigated. First, we will take a brief look back to the origins of such assignments, which dealt with the meaning of images of science and with a theoretical foundation in semiotics. Um, such approaches have emerged at the Basel School of Design since the late 1960s in the courses of graphic design teacher Armin Hoffmann in the postgraduate classes for graphic design. Here we see a final result of a so-called semiotic study from Hoffmann's course the different signs in juxtaposition. The student first researched the origin, meaning, and current use of a given object. In this case, it was the apple, for example, in religion, in art, or politics. And then she developed visual representations of her research results. The apple silhouette was varied. It was combined with different illustrations, with photography, lettering, etc. And through these so-called graphic manipulations, the apple itself becomes the apple from the Bible, the big apple or the apple logo. Armin Hoffmann published a summary of his teaching method, including this student work shown here, retrospectively in 1985 in an essay entitled Thoughts on the Study and Making of Visual Science. The very choice of title indicates a paradigm shift that had taken place within design education from the traditional understanding of applied graphics towards that of visual communication. Hoffman's courses had also shifted from focusing mainly on questions of form and composition in the 1950s to focusing on the making of images and the creation of signs, in other words, towards exploring communicative processes. For example, in this study, um, the student investigated how the photo of a hammer here in the center becomes a symbol, which image juxtapositions are transforming its meaning. How do pre-existing connotations, for example, historically grown attributions influence this transformation? Or more concrete, how does the hammer react in combination with the sickle and the Rolls Royce? In his article, Armin Hoffmann connected his assignments to findings from semiotics. However, in his opinion, the discourse on science was lacking practical relevance. Not only semioticians, but mainly designers should deal with science. And he stated a previous lack of assignments on this topic at design schools. In fact, findings from semiotics had already been implemented at other design schools in the 1940s and 50s. 
However, Hoffman did not advocate for semiotics as a theory course for design students. On the contrary, he had a concept of so-called applied semiotics. Semiotics was thus, thus never taught as a theory course in Basel, but it was used at, by the instructor as a base to develop practical assignments such as those shown here. Here we juxtapose an historical example from Hoffmann semiotic studies on the left side with the current example from one of my courses on the right. The courses is called semiotic and I'm giving it in the first year bachelor visual communication. The students have eight days in total to deal with the fundamentals of the effect and perception of visual signs. Comparable to Hoffmann, the juxtaposition is essential here. In this example, three images are placed next to each other, whereby the middle one always remains the same, resulting in a multitude of combinations of three images. And as I've pointed out earlier, the approach in the 1970s here on the left was rather conceptual. First, the students researched and sketched certain meanings, and then they created and juxtaposed signs. Thus, the students tried to specifically generate predefined meanings, and it was also assumed that the viewers would understand these meanings as intended by the designers. The exercises for my course, none of the images are created by the students. All are taken from the internet, which offers billions of photos. This assignment requires new decision-making competencies in searching, selecting, limiting, instead of creating images. The exercises today leave more room for negotiation about the diverse meanings that images can take. How does the sign like emerge that creates meaning? What are the aspects in the images that speak to us that communicate? At first, this student her, based her selection purely on formal resemblances, such as the very thin linear straps of the top, the linear wire coat hanger, the metal base of the chair, or the amount of black in the images. But then she examined what statement is made when the chair is pictured next to the black top and next to it, a bowl of black rice. Does a story a narration emerge? Are there other ways to read the combinations of images? Is there only an atmosphere? Do polarizing meanings emerge? The male stag beetle with the antlers, will those become pincers or scissors next to the light carrier top? And the aubergine, does it add an association of plump, smooth skin? The combination with the fluffy key ring and the gun, what kind of milieu is this? In class, we do not define in advance what is to be communicated but observe the changes that happen when images interact. The students learn to distinguish and differentiate how meaning is created and how it can be manipulated. They develop a sensitivity towards images. Meaning is to be agreed upon. The cultural, the so social origin are addressed in the reading of images. This is an example by another student for whom the same assignment led to a completely different solution of eight image juxtapositions. As initial image, the student picked this snapshot of a girl hidden under a lampshade. I'm going to browse through the series first without commenting to let the image cycle speak for itself.
already the first juxtaposition is provocative. The cutout of a drooping, drooping female breast covered with pepper stains. Is there a formal resemblance to the girl's dotted dress? The bare knees peeking out under the dress. And other? The small pink rectangle, the color in the girl's dress and in the lampshade, delicate, warm. A boy sitting with a jumper over his head, hiding his head, like the girls. Next, please. The arm position, the gesture of the hand that formally relates to the sitting girl, body posture, the gray core sofa cover on which the girl is sitting with bare legs scratching, a painting of a woman along in public transport, loneliness, anonymity, a Polaroid of a neck hickey, embarrassment, hiding under the lampshade. I chose this student work because in my opinion, it is most far removed from the, the traditional assignments. It shows how a broader understanding of what can become a sign allows the student to pick all kinds of images. It enables to question communicative aspects in the primary and secondary level of meaning. Each juxtaposition focuses on a different part, a different situation, a different atmosphere in the initial image, thus pointing to its richness and complexity. Please name the object you see on the screen. Say only one word as quickly and as precise as possible. What comes to your mind when you look at these images? Drill. Roughly, material. Model, where, city, separation, living space, mix, thoughts, discussion, industry, people, chunks, highway, possibility, neighborhood, peace, color, high rises, traffic circle, intersection, God, air, Parking garage, consideration, park, car, freeway access, truck, future, plastic, history, urban planning, sense, old building, house, renovation, building structure, contrast, car, city, corona, time, society, Attitude, go. Arguing. Superman, science fiction figure, heat. Neighborhood, voices, interim use, paddle game, hall, potential, company administration. Conversation, dialogue, man, gender, age, children, project, direction, street art, urban development, discourse, human, happening, relation, year, submission, context, phase, process, point of view, friction. Vision, identity, rootedness, place, possibility, collective, change, breeding ground, sense, norms, 
confrontation, influence, hope. Developing communication through images between precision and openness. In our contribution, which is based on two different research projects, we dialogue about how images can facilitate, enable, or inspire communication. One of those research projects is called e-inclusion. The goal of this interdisciplinary project is to develop an image concept for the unambiguous depiction of nouns and verbs. These unambiguous images are integrated into an application that supports language reacquisition for persons with aphasia. To train the relearning of speech, images of objects or activities are used in aphasia therapy. Images are processed in a different area of the brain than speech. That's the reason why they can be perceived correctly by persons with aphasia. In my project, the image must evoke a unique term so that the speech recognition system of the app can classify the word as correct or incorrect. Misrecognition of the depicted object based on an ambiguity of the image must therefore be avoided. The other interdisciplinary research project presented here, the role of images in participatory processes in the context of urban planning is investigated. In order to stimulate constructive discussions in participatory processes, images are needed that leave room for as many interpretations as possible. The supplement to the widespread visualizations of urban planning projects, which often appear as if every detail has already been thought through to the end. Guiding research questions of the two projects both relate to the design of images, but aim at a different verbal outcome. In my project, the question is how images must look like to trigger a specific concept to evoke a single word in the patient. And how do images have to be designed so that they evoke an open discussion? That's the question in my project, where the aim is to stimulate an inclusive discussion among a group of people. In my project, we investigated several image features. As an example, the reduction of details. Reduction of information facilitates recognition, an aspect that is, that is inherent in an illustration compared to a photograph. Moreover, in an illustration it is possible to reinforce important recognition features. In this example shown here, the face color of the diver in the illustration has a natural color, even when the person is depicted while in the water. In my project, it was obvious that in pictures containing text, the written words had a determinant effect on the associations pictures evoked. In many cases, people would read them out loud, like talk, 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 switcher, hee, <laughs> crash. In my project, we integrated another crucial aspect for naming images correctly, called image agreement. This term signifies the correspondence of the depicted image with one's own mental image. Therefore, it is important to create the most iconic representation of a concept. But the precision of the imageability also has to do with the term itself. Precision is possible with a term like dice, 
because there are almost no other current terms describing this object. With the image on the right, this is less easy. Terms like fir tree, Christmas tree, sprouse, tree are all correct here, without any possibility to make the image more unique. In my project, people had a tendency to link the images they talked about to places they knew or try to find out how the images were made. If there was only a few information perceivable in an image, the range of associations they evoked was rather poor. The starting point of this talk are two different but related research projects, dealing with the relationship between words and images. In the course of our dialogue for this presentation, we talked about the similarities and differences between our projects. In doing so, we came to common conclusions. One of the most revealing conclusions was to us, to us as designers that the image modality is rather secondary. What is more important is the reference to the mental image, which relates what is depicted to the experience of the viewer. In this sense, we consider it fundamental that the design of images includes the possibility of a personal relationship between the image and the viewer. Tom Beats, are you ready? Seduction or proof, revealing assumptions in the negotiation of perceived reality through drawings and photographs. In reference to early sources of reflection upon the agency of images, we find a reoccurring binary coded description of them. The image understood as being a seductive copy of what we perceive as reality, or secondly, the image as an inscription of what we perceive as proof of an instance in reality. This contribution analyzes drawings and photographs in regard to their relationship to perceived reality. A drawing consists of lines, material traces resulting from the gestural process of the designer. In its difference to photography, the drawing reveals its status as an interpretation. A drawing is recognized as a selection of qualities of the depicted object. Nevertheless, there are distinct levels in the relationship of images to reality. We can differentiate in the dependency of images in respect to four notions of reality, asking the following four questions. What is the relationship of the image to our perceived reality? What kind of shared understanding does a social cultural context contain of the representation of reality in an image? And thirdly, what is the reference of the image to the individual identity of the designer? And last but not least, what reality is given through the materiality contained in the tools used for the image? In order to approach an answer to these questions, we can turn to a set of experiments conducted with a group of master students in visual communication. When asked to draw a fictional portrait, which makes the beholder believe that it is the representation of an existing person, it is part of the exercise that there is no direct relationship between drawing and an individual person. We have answered the first question already. There is no relationship in this case between the portrait and the sitter. But why do we assume that this drawing is the representation of a living being? Why does occasionality, as Hans-Georg Gadamer would call it, appear? First of all, the general composition and relationship of the anatomical features in the discussed drawings follow 
an expected description of a face, but the variation and interpretation of forms is not schematic, predictable, symmetrical, or repetitive. The similarity of the eyes, for example, is preserved, but not through a mere repetition of lines. We can say that the social cultural context and its reality is represented in the drawing through the schematic convention of the representation of a face and the quality of the unpredictable lines understood as lively and natural. Furthermore, the quality of the strokes of the drawings discussed are energetic, confident, and appear to be results of a spontaneous gesture. Their use is consistent throughout the drawing without being repetitive. The different means of representations, lines, gray values, and textures are used to convey a logical spatial relationship. The consistent use of the marks and traces in the drawing emphasizes the presence of the individual designer leaving a personal interpretation, observing a sitter in his or her drawing. Through the consistent application of the tools and their affordances in a pragmatic way, the medium becomes less apparent. The tools and materials are employed appropriately, and we may ask in how far this appropriateness is again influenced by a shared understanding of the tools of representation. If we turn now to the assessment of the agency of image being on one hand deceiving and on the other hand providing proof of re a real situation, we can draw the following conclusion from the discussion. The relationship to a shared schema, the appropriate use of tools and materials, the individuality of gestural traces and their reference to a designer's identity, unpredictable lines, avoidance of symmetry and repetition contribute in combination to the assumption that the fictional drawing is an interpretation in view of the depicted person. Translating the four notions developed on the example of the portrait drawing to photography, we can ask how the presence of the maker as well as the apparatuses of photography find their meanings in the exchange with the materiality of the photographed environments. Photographic images are also seen on the one hand in the binary of a technical mean that aims at representing reality, and on the other hand as things that create illusions of reality. At its most basic form, a photograph conveys a type of a presence at the site, at least the presence of the camera and the photographer. The photograph participates in an act of displacement, which bridges the gap between the moment and places of its recording and its viewing. In the field of architecture photography, for example, a displacement defines the hierarchy between architecture and its image. We have accepted architecture as the original and the photograph as a second order representation of it. This brings us to a fundamental debate of Western philosophy as seen in Plato's comparison between the truth of speech over writing as something that is mediated. Based on Plato, it is the presence of the speaker that shapes the unmediated truth. Following this logic, we have to think of architectonic presence as the truth and any other form of architecture as models, writings, or images, mediations of this presence. However, is the presence of architecture itself not mediated by its materials, among other things, just like speech that is mediated by language? If so, what if we use materials themselves as a mediator between architecture and its image? Would this approach help us in the ambitious task of challenging the privileged position of the original? Roland Barthes, in his book Camera Lucida, claims that we do not see a photograph, but we see through it. For Barthes, a photograph is not an object. It does not really exist. We can challenge this position when we compare an object and its photograph next to one another in the installation shot of figure one. Here, two types of materials are present. Four stone fragments on the one hand and four photographic copies of these stones on the other. 
The fragments of the photograph are made of several layers of laser prints glued together in order to create an impression of thickness and depth. This experiment narrows the gap between the stone surface and the surface of the photograph by exploring similar tensions of both. The photograph is no longer an invisible surface, but it is rather a simulation which participates in the four dimensional world. This approach brings the autonomy of the photograph in the foreground by freeing it to a certain degree from the representational task which is imposed on it. In this process, photographs next to the real material can be seen as agencies that help define additional qualities of materials. Therefore, we can say that the entire photographical process can be interpreted as a materialist event. In the sequence of the nine photographs of figure two, collaging different parts of different photos together conveys illusions of lighting. Neither of the represented temporalities is real in its singular form. Rather, it is the totality of the photograph as a sequence which illustrates architectonic space as a fluid process. The same materials would not be perceived and therefore understood in the same way if they were experienced directly. It is under these circumstances that the privileged positions of, of architecture as the only reality of the building can be questioned. Simulating architecture into other things, such as images, can add to its reality. To borrow from Deleuze, we can say that it is this process of simulation that challenges the privileged position of the original. In figure three, in the left photograph, a printed copy of a concrete block is placed on top of it. On this photograph, the different materials of the two blocks are not understandable. In the right photograph, once the position of the model and the image are switched, the materiality of each becomes evident. The illusion of reality of the left photo is unveiled through the photograph on the right. Here, the crushed photo is a singular simulation, which is not repeatable like a two-dimensional reprinted photograph. It is no more a copy, but rather a simulation that becomes a part of the material world by revealing its own reality. In the context of photographic images, we have shown that through a materialist approach, images can tell us something different about their subject matter. They can add something to it by creating a dialogue with its material in order to shape something different. This narrative adds to our direct experience of architectonic space through a material exchange between images and the represented objects. Perhaps we can call this narrative realer than real. We can also interpret the presented photographs as experiments which overcome through the material formation, the preconceived transparency of the photograph, a quality which is inherent in the drawing. Going back to the binary notion of images as being seductive or a proof of perceiving reality, we have differentiated the, pre the preconceived notion and infer that drawings and photographs always contain both aspects of the poles in this spectrum. Thank you. Optimize for video clip here. Video clip Drag and drop and its discursive effects on designing. When graphic designers work on a design task, they engage with both the communicative objectives and the various interests of the stakeholders. 
For example, when the design fee is negotiated, when design objectives are weighted, prioritized and sharpened with the client, or when the designer evaluates individual designs with her colleagues. These interactions and certainly many more can be described as negotiation in which the parties and their interests confront each other. Another more intimate type of negotiation occurs when the designer is alone with her software and works on the design task. In this situation, the designer engages in an internal monologue with different roles. She generates design through trial and error, responding to the different roles she anticipates. In this situation, she uses the design to debate with herself and the anticipated viewpoints about the appropriateness of the generated form and the design brief. For example, the designer evaluates the visual impact of a particular design for the target audience in a specific context, or she compares the favorite design with the mental picture of the status quo and the start of the art in print design. When the graphic designer works on a task this way, she relies on her visual experience and imagination to anticipate the various roles. This can be understood as an internalized form of social negotiation in which the hardware and software also take on the role of an actor. This means that the hardware and software enable certain creative actions, but also limit the scope of action and render other actions impossible. So in what ways does the graphical user interface constrain the design process or consequently the internal social negotiation? In other words, which design actions and decisions does the graphical user interface enable or prevent? And how does it affect negotiating with images? The following is not a technological investigation or a media analysis of the graphical user interface. Instead, my objective is to observe and describe a fundamental operation of human computer interaction, namely dragging and dropping from the perspective of design making and through an action-based and autosensory approach. I investigate this using drag and drop function of the layout software in InDesign. My first step is to break down what designers do with drag and drop and then observe what it enables or prevents. I developed the view that drag and drop has different meanings for different moments in, of the design process. Design in terms of in German Gestaltung, meaning the shaping of form, and on the other hand, design in terms of ger in German Entwurf, meaning the drafting of form. I use the term image equivalent to layout, graphic, or design in the following. Looking back at the technological history of the graphical user interface and the beginnings of human computer interaction, we know that with Ivan Sutherland's invention of drag and drop, the paradigm of textual, textual command input was replaced by drawing based command input. The visualization of images, however vague or, and provisional they may be, means that the designer creates the data set for the printing. As it has already many seen many times in the, as, as it has already seen many times in print history, of graphic design, this means that with the advent of the personal computer, traditional pre-press skills and professions are being shifted to the designer's responsibility. For the form filing process, this means ever since that the designer has to incorporate an additional role in her internalized social negotiation. But now let's take a closer look at the operation drag and drop in InDesign. At the very basic level, drag and drop is the central and superordinated operation when it comes to manipulating graphical objects using a pointing device. Technically seen, moving objects through drag and drop is basically a visualization of copy and paste or cut and paste. However, from the perspective of designing, it makes a huge difference whether a graphical object is just moved or copied. As you see here, in this very simple demo, the designer draws up shapes, touches the nodes of the vector graphic, moves color sliders, and places the graphics in relation to each other. This is a drag and drop operation um, that is visible in terms of drawing, composition, or feature changes. Some graphics are then duplicated 
in order to make further changes without losing the old design. In this case, the drag and drop is part of the operation of copy and paste. As you see here in the next example, the case example of layouting a brochure, the same drag and drop operation is used through duplicating an entire page layout in the page control window. By multiple duplicating and varying, the designer creates a complex tableau of different design ideas in which old and new ideas stand side, stand side by side on an equal footing. Looking closer now how the layout variations evolved, one can see that in example one shown here, several variations were made on the title design. In example two, the designer tried out what effect a six page versus a eight page has. We can observe that the layout variations one and two enter into a relationship with each other through the differences which evoke questions and motivate the designer to further investigate. In consequence, the variations number three was created, which combined ideas one and two. For the form finding process, this has the effect that single layout ideas do not only enter into a dialogue with each other, but also that this dialogue provokes to produce more design variations. If we compare now drag and drop for the purpose of shaping images with the drag and drop aiming to make copies and variations, then it can be stated that drag and drop follows different logics. As an image shaping operation in terms of Gestaltung, drag and drop creates the differences in the layout or image. It shapes the design and the look of specific graphics, images, typography and layouts and allows flexible handling. As a drafting operation, though, it initiates the difference between design versions. It organizes the design process and provides rather inflexible choices. This drag and drop provides the framework for images to negotiate with images. Unlike current design theory, which understands designing predominantly as a process of synthesizing, the drag and drop I observed here as the ambivalent function of both merging ideas, as well as exposing contradictions and contrasts between them. The function of the drafting drag and drop is to give space to the different positions and responses manifested through the designs. It orders design versions and makes them comparable. Similar to parliamentary debate, it allocates speaking time to the different positions determines the order in which they are presented and gives the speakers a stage. This drafting drag and drop sharpens the differences and similarities between the various arguments put forward, but without excluding individual positions. If we understand designing as a strategic activity to test ideas, then dragging and dropping can be seen as a sub action within this activity. It is so fundamental and omnipresent that it is difficult to regard it as a discrete unit. But when we manage to look closer at basic operations like this and how they, inter how they intermingle, the way how we create images then becomes also a type of image, which we can also judge by its aesthetic qualities. Thank you. So we come to our conclusion. In this colloquium, we presented how we at the Academy of Arts and Design in Basel explore, use, and investigate the discursive effects of images on different levels. In teaching, we generally aim at enabling the students' reflection on images and their meaning. But this can be done in different ways, by starting with theoretical discourse about images, our experience and own visual thinking of pictures as shown in my contribution by drawing on the tr traditional design practice and realigning it to research into pictures by producing different series of pictures as Paloma showed. This method of variations was and is part of teaching visual communication in Basel as Viola and Sandra demonstrated by producing 
pairing and comparing images, the students were made aware of the ways how small variations can affect the meaning of pictures. In the past, this awareness was primarily aiming at visually conveying a clear and precise semiotic message. Today, we place much more emphasis on the awareness of the intrinsic complexity of images and their meaning. But the importance of the form of the images and their discursive effect was perhaps even more evident in Susan's and Claire's research projects. Both projects deal with the relation of pictures and discursive situations and conduct research into the adequate form of images that are used for enabling participation in very different linguistic practices. In the rehabilitation of aphasic patients, pictures should be as unambiguous as possible so that the patients can name the depicted object and thus exercise everyday language. In contrast, for enhancing participation in urban planning processes, it is wanted to include as many um, different and diverse perspectives as possible, for which pictures that are rather vague and in wide associations are suitable. But the form and type of images is not only of importance for our relation to discursive situations. As Michael and Cumbis demonstrated with reference to the mechanical picture of photography, as well as the gestural image of drawing, the form of images are also decisive and the materiality of images is also decisive for the way how we conceive and relate to reality through pictures. However, it would be too simple to merely start with a given form of images or their creation by the designer and then examine its discursive effects. For every image is itself created in media contexts and under technical conditions. As Natasha discussed, with reference to the drag and drop functionality of InDesign, the designer always negotiates with these preconditions when she creates images. Therefore, as the form of the images entails discursive effects, it is at least partly also an effect of a situation that is discursive in a broad sense. Consequently, we discussed the form of images with their discursive situations on very different levels in teaching with respect to our participation in different linguistic practices, our relations to reality, and finally, with respect to the digital environments in which we make pictures. At first glance, it could seem rather accidental that a common denominator of all these very different investigations is that they rely crucially on the use of pairs or production of series of pictures. However, this is anything but random. It is tradition at the Basel School of Design to see the variations in series as a genuine means of investigating visual communication. That is, to observe the sometimes sweeping ramifications of slight variations of graphical designs, and thus to learn better, uh, to learn to better determine what and how the different results communicate. Over the last few decades, we have developed from this an own research approach. This practice-based approach aims at a better understanding of the visual resources of images and complements the theoretical discourse about pictures in the wake of the iconic or pictorial term with its own practice-based reflection. In this image research based on image variations and series, we have always included various visual media and materialities. In the coming years, however, we will pay even more attention to digital media or digital environments in which most of our communication takes place today. For this research too, we think and hope that the systematic production of variation series will be valued in order to reflect on their different effects and discourse and communication. Thanks a lot for your attention, and we are very much looking forward to your questions and the discussion.
Are you moderating Claire or Arnold? Um, that's not decided yet, but we need a question at least. So questions are invited. <laughs> Maybe we should, we should ask how the conference is in <laughs> Lisbon. <laughs> there is a question. Hello, Ruben from Portugal. I would like to ask something to the audience. Why don't you ask that, Ruben? Would you, Ruben, would you like to turn on your microphone or would you like to formulate your question in the chat? Where does visual citizenship stand concerning social participation? I cannot speak, sorry, he says. Um, so where does visual citizenship stand concerning social participation? It's maybe mostly directed or related to the project of visual communication in participatory projects um, of urban planning, which Susan Kaeser um, has uh, presented, not, not really in depth, but uh, this is one of our big concerns there, but maybe Susan can give us a little bit more insight on that. Yes, uh, hello, Ruben and everybody else. Uh, I want to ask, especially. Okay, I will try to answer that and then I will read the rest. <laughs> so, yeah, where does it stand? I don't know, but we are trying to give it a voice somehow that uh, the visuals citizenship is a is a nice term for this i think that is really that it gets more and more a way to um, express needs and demands also in our context in the urban planning through images and raise a voice through visual means and not only uh, in discussions or um, with with words yes and uh, this is uh, not so common yet. It's more maybe, um, let's say, not so in the in the embedded context. It's more a, a subversive way so far that citizens raise their voice by posting some small stickers everywhere in the city or yeah, claim their rights, but it's not so embedded yet. And we try to really uh, give that more space in the, in the let's say, ordinary um, way of debating uh, urban planning. So now the, the second question is, I want to ask spe specifically is, do you feel that with all this amount of photography, do we are more allowed to participate civilly or not? And how? Yeah. I mean, there are all these uh, social media channels, but I think this is somehow not enough. I think we need to develop more platforms. Do we need a new visual vocabulary? more literacy for young students, a more accurate understanding of visual power. Yes, of course, that's what we need. That's what we also try to teach. <laughs> so maybe I can uh, hand over to, to Arno or Viola, all um, yeah, the contributions about teaching. I mean, may I add here something because I know a little bit, uh, hi Ruben, 
I know a little bit of the project and collaborated with it. And um, the, the first and, and primary aim is to enhance participation by using visual media. Yeah? Because linguistic participation is sometimes very limited because of different reasons. And so uh, there is a political interest to enhance participation. And we can add, in a way, um, um, an empirical research about using visual media for enhancing participation. But for sure, um, you have the problem that, um, that different people have different visual literacies, you know, as in linguistic practices. And um, we have specific standards of making pictures of this or that type. Yeah? But it is really in the focus of the project to experiment with different visual media, not only with photography, also with other ones and with combinations and superimpositions of different visual media in order to invite people to participate. Yeah? So the aim is enhancing participation, but you won't find an easy solution. This is uh, exactly in the focus of the project. Try to find out what kind of pictures are suitable for this aim. Yeah? And um, one uh, conclusion was presented, um, I think, rather clear. Um, as far as I know, uh, the empirical part of the project, but possibly Susan can follow up on this. Um, it's the openness and weightness of pictures that invite to association that allows people to participate and to, and to articulate on very different levels. They are diverse perspectives um, that are valuable for the urban planning process. I hope this is a little bit, um, it fits to your question. Are there further questions? There is one in the chat. Will images replace words? Hmm. At, at least in the moment, we are missing very much the <laughs> words and we only have images. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Can images replace words? Yes, yeah, still Ruben. Is, is it you who is typing or who is typing? I don't know. <laughs> you are laughing. <laughs> yes, please. Hello, sorry. I, I, I couldn't speak uh, uh, for the, uh, There was a lot of noise. Uh, good afternoon for, uh, to everyone. Thanks for the, all the presentations. I have been very uh, carefully listening to all of you. I'm, I'm trying to provoke all of you, uh, but at the same time, I, I, I think I have a little, um, I'm afraid of, of the answer. Um, <laughs> I, I am a teacher uh, for more than 20 years. I'm actually also a photographer and a videographer, and I have just finished my PhD on visual uh, citizenship. So I'm not the best guy to, to ask my own question, but I, I think I can try. I actually see all my students uh, talking and, and chatting, um, sending images of what they want to talk about, uh, which is kind of a, a strange thing to, to say. I mean, if they see something happening, they just take a picture and send without even a caption or a legend or something else. Uh, and that is somehow strange, but also satisfying. And, and, and it's a challenge for, for, for all of us, the students, visual uh, investigators and, and, and teachers as well. So I don't think, uh, at least I, I don't want to, to, to think that pictures will uh, uh, 
substitute or, or um, replace words. I, I'm more keen thinking about a, a way of mixing them in a proper way. I mean, trying to mix what we see uh, with what we can explain from what we see. Uh, that's my, well, my quick answer to my own uh, question, but I, I actually don't know where are we going. Um, I'm very afraid of, of the, those students that actually uh, don't write too much because when I try to talk to them, I, they actually think about things, but they don't write about them. Um, I, I, I can understand that uh, sending an emoji or a, a, an icon or a picture or, or, or a video, a small video, it, it's, it's, well, it, it's cheaper. They don't have to, to worry about texting. Um, but I don't know if they are going um, to spend much of their time thinking of what they are doing. It's, it's very instantaneous. So we, we, as long as we still live in this world of instantaneity, they will keep chatting um, the easier way. And the easier, the easier way is pictures. Uh, and I don't want to say that, that the picture is the message, but well, it's kind of a provoking quotation, but uh, a picture can say more than some words. Um, and I believe that they are already in that world. Uh, but I don't know what are we, where are we going, but I'm, still, I'm a little bit afraid that only images or only words will uh, not sum up very well the world we live in. And I, I believe, just to finish, uh, I believe that we need both of them. Uh, and the, the good, or at least a new visual vocabulary for everything that we see. Because uh, in this world of everything is fake and not fake, and we have to be all checking all the days, we have to be checking everything. I believe that we have to make a, a new commitment uh, uh, to rebuild or make some strengths on, on, on trust. And if we have no trust in what we see, we will have a, a big problem in the future. So thank you, thanks, and sorry for all the, the, the intervention. No, thank you. There is also a comment in the chat from Ayana Salto, which I could read. I believe so. I feel that we are increasingly entering the era of instantaneity. Images like ideograms bring us closer to the speed of meaning. This is not necessarily a good thing. For me, it demonstrates a growing anxiety towards lack of reading. So some, somehow. I, I, can, can I talk again? Sure, sure. <laughs> I, 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 I was, I had a, a little bit of a discussion with, with my mentor um, here in Portugal because I was standing for an idea that images convey emotion more than ever. Um, and we, we, we post images because we probably would like to, to be there or be in that place or, or feel that thing. Uh, not, not, not exactly what we can think or feel that different thing. I totally agree with Diana. Um, th that's not a good thing. The, the, the thing is it happens uh, and it, actually uh, demonstrates anxiety and probably an easier and almost safe way of chatting and posting because if we post a picture that we didn't take um, somehow we cannot talk for, for, for it but we can be uh, asked for responsibility if we text uh, that, that's a very personal opinion but uh, considering emotion in, we still have that, that, that idea of uh, indexicality towards photography. And uh, another discussion that actually, I, I believe was the, the, the most, well, the, the most difficult and, and the most stupid one was uh, keeping always chatting and, 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 and asking and, and discussing if uh, photography uh, is or is not uh, an art form. Uh, they, they just don't want to know about that. Uh, I mean, uh, I can have my personal opinion, but that uh, didn't allow us uh, to discuss uh, the emotion that the picture conveys, uh, the significance of the picture, what we understand, the, 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 the sensitive and the sensible part. 
and we, we spent too much time uh, uh, discussing about if, if it's art or, or not art. And I understand, and, and I totally agree with, with Diana, when, um, when we see that it is, it's an increasing phenomenon in, in, in the net, or on the net, it, it actually demonstrates that the emotion or emotion is one of the, the big topics uh, that, that people feel and need to, to understand. And in, in, the, in, the, in the late uh, study that, that I went through, uh, even in, in COVID with the, the pandemic situation, it increased. So uh, you can say that, okay, we, we, were, we have much more time to, to be on the net. Okay, but if we get attention to the type of images that we actually post, there was an, a, a big increase of uh, emotive uh, pictures on the internet. So it's not just a question of indexicality, it's a question of feelings and emotions. And sometimes I believe that all the academy lacks a little bit of courage discussing that because it's a, it's a very difficult way, it's a very difficult theme and topic to discuss about. And sometimes we 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 don't we don't even have the the um, uh, we are not sure about some some of these new methods and some of these new uh, motions that are, are going on on the web and talk about feelings or emotions. It's very difficult and bringing that uh, into photography it's even more difficult so i believe we could start by that i believe we, we could start uh, thinking and discussing what does well like mitchell used to say what pictures do uh, what actually a picture does to you okay and, and that's what actually feels uh, more important for me if a picture uh, makes you feel or or see something and if it changes you. Uh, and that's for me the, the most important part, even if it's art form or not. May I intervene here for a moment? Uh, because I think it's a very important and interesting discussion, but I would like to, to specify it a little bit further because possibly it's not a question about images replacing words, but what kind of images are used for fast communication? and what kind of images are not suitable for fast communication and what kind of uh, linguistic expressions are suitable for fast communication. Possibly it's primarily about the speed of communication. And if you want to communi communicate fast, and that was Ayana's point in the chat, then you have to use very simple pictures. Pictures which you suppose are easy to understand at least for your social group or your uh, your pals or something like that. Um, but specific, ambiguous, um, ambivalent, complex pictures you can't use for easy, fast communication. So I have the impression it's not primarily the question of the replacement of images as such uh, or replacement of words by images. It's more about the dominance of the specific simple format of pictures, which are supposed to com communicate fast and easy. And that is possibly just one strand of communication uh, by visual media. You will find others possibly where it's not fast communication, which is uh, the sole aim. So I have a question. I have a little bit the, the intuition to say it's it's more about complexity, or it's more about fast, easy, simple, or. You have some time, you need some time, you can use, you can communicate much more differentiated things, ambivalent and ambiguous emotions, and then you need more complex visuals. And that takes time. And it's, sim it's similar in words. Yeah? You can easily uh, communicate, I hate you, or I want to kill you. You find this everywhere. But if you want to, to articulate your uh, experience of the pandemic situation at home, then you possibly need much more words and someone needs much more time to read. So for me, it's not a question of either or, or either words or images. It's much more about how much time we take in order to express and to understand and to communicate in visuals or words. Yeah, can I answer to Arno? Of course. Yeah, it, it, was, it, was, it was, I was provoking everyone, but uh, 
and yes, I totally agree with you. The speed and, and scale, it's a question of scale uh, and speed as well. Uh, but the, the same medium that actually puts your, your picture or, or your video on the top of the most viewed, it's, it's the same medium that actually can swallow your, uh, your picture as well. I mean, uh, you are on, on the internet, you, you actually uh, cannot control the, the I think it, it, it was um, Ian again that, that said that you cannot control the time or, 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 or the limit of time that you are actually seeing it in, a, in an art gallery or in a normal gallery. You have the picture physically in front of you and you just, well, you take your time. Uh, you, even in Instagram, the algorithm works in, in, in a way that you can actually, you cannot actually um, decide with, with what kind of pictures do you actually see or on Facebook. And we are dealing with a speed that we cannot actually control. Um, the question is, you, I, I think you said, Arno, that what, what matters is what images are used uh, or are our students using to, um, to chat or to communicate. That's exactly what, uh, what I, I, I intend to, to study in advance because uh, for them, actually, those pictures have a meaning. Uh, and they do something for them, and they actually mean something. And if you are talking about reception, and, and assuming that the pictures they use are not do are not made, or they didn't make, they didn't take it them. I mean, not 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 the the, the ones that um, puts the picture online, but the ones that use those images, reception made. So, if we uh, put ourselves in the context that we actually try to understand what pictures do to people that use them to communicate, I think we can bring up uh, and, and open up a little bit more a new way of communication. Uh, that's exactly the point I was talking about. I mean, if you bring pictures into your uh, grammar, into your, into your communication uh, grid, we, you can actually, um, not, not, not replacing, of course, but you can add uh, another way of meaning to your communication that, I mean, it's new uh, until now. Uh, and, and that speed, the, the, the way we use them, the speed we use them actually dictates uh, the communication. And that's one thing I cannot talk about. I mean, I, I, it, it's almost impossible to, to uh, say something finally. Or conclusive about that, even if you try to, to study a, a certain public or, or, or a university type of people, or I don't know. But it, it's very uh, different from my father's generation, for my generation, and for my students' uh, generation. Yes, yeah, so it, it, we could say it's not really a question of images or language, but it is. Um, a question of how much care we take to communicate um, and the media we use today in, in social media or even uh, the email <laughs> tends uh, to be abbreviated and leaves a lot of space um, for misinterpretation as we know from email. <laughs> um, we don't really know what, uh, what the other person emotional state is in a lot of short business messages. And of course, um, this is also used in, uh, as Ayana points out in politics, um, to abbreviate something in a way that it is deceiving um, and is not uh, differentiated anymore. Um, so it's, it, I can be differentiated in language, but I need, some space to do it um, or some time to do it as a person who sends the message, but also as a person to, to, who interprets the message or receives the message. Um, and yes, of course, we ho all hope that there will be a good combination of the two things. And this will not be all covered up by the dynamics of the channels themselves. Um, that you, you are forced to be quick, that you are forced to not have time to interpret what it's really meant or um, to not have learned 
to understand an image. Language, we at least learn somehow to a certain degree um, what it means. With images, I still think it's, um, it's a mystery <laughs> how, we, how we interpret them and what all influences how we interpret them, um, which is of course another discussion again. But maybe there are some more questions or provocations from our chat. Is anybody in Lisbon? I am. Okay, okay. So it takes it takes place also there. Um, yeah, it's three thirty in the afternoon. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's why I'm trying to speak in between chaos. Okay, okay. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. We would have all liked to travel there. <laughs> Um, but um, we would have liked to travel there. Yeah, but, I would really enjoy having you here. But it is, uh, of course, right now still difficult. Yeah. Yes, yes. We will go have some dinner. We have a great gastronomical uh, history here around Portugal. You make us hungry now already. <laughs> And lots of good wine as well. Without an image. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Are there any more questions you would like to provocations, feedback, criticism? If not, I would like to just say some closing words because we are actually also at the end of our time slot. Um, I hope you all enjoyed our presentation. We know it was quite dense because we wanted to show a lot of different aspects that we, that we work on at our institute. And of course, as Mike Turana already said, we would have loved to to meet you all in physical presence in Lisbon, but we hope that this would be possible next year or in another context. I'm not sure if we need to finish now because the schedule is that we that we have 90 minutes and if there are other um, um, other conference um, appointments you need to or you would like to attend. So I would like to thank you again for participating, for your comments, for your attention. And yes, we look forward to be in contact some way or the other. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Uh, thank you. So we go over to the